Welcome to the Tuesday edition of the Morning Pit right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com. I'm Chris Peak from PantherLair.com, <laughs> PantherLair.com. It's Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. That's mother the mothership behind all of this that we do right here on YouTube is that website right there, Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. It's where we've got all of our articles, all of our interviews, our video breakdowns, analysis, slideshows, all the different things we do. And then, of course, where the message boards are, where you can have lots of conversation all day, every day with other Pitt fans. Panther-Lair.com. I think it's the best online community of Pitt fans that you're going to find. And it's right there at PantherLair.com. And, and really, this show that we do here every you know every morning, Monday through Friday, on YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com, it's, it's an extension of what we do on the website. You know, I talk about the things here that we're writing about and talking about on pantherlair.com and I break down the depth chart changes or talk about injuries or things about guys that should, you know, rest on Saturday or should they play or shouldn't they play? I mean, all of that stuff is like I say, we talk about it here and it's an extension of pantherlair.com. So if you enjoy these videos and I very much appreciate it if you do, uh, you also need to check out panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. And of course, as we always say, if you enjoy these videos, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button that is right down there. Hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, that way you always get an alert every time we go live or release a new Morning Pit video. We're on a pretty good schedule with our live shows on Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Uh, the Panther Lair Show right here on YouTube.com slash Panther Lair Com. But we also go live after the games. And so that could be shortly after the game or a little while after the game. And, you know, last week... 7.30 kickoff for the Western Michigan game. Didn't know what time that game was going to end. Pitt's first two games were both four-hour affairs. If Saturday night was another four-hour game, we might not start until midnight. Well, it ended around 11, so we were able to get things ready to go and, and jump into it at 11.30. But it was up in the air. Well, if, you have your if you're have your if subscribed to our YouTube channel and you have the notifications turned on, you have alerts set, then you're going to find out. You're going to get something sent right to your phone saying, Hey, yo. Panther Lair is live. Time to go check out the postgame show. So this week, you know, you've got a noon game against Rhode Island. Um, I actually have a few obligations right after the game, so it'll be a little bit later. Maybe it'll be like an 8 o'clock start. We'll do a postgame show around 8, you know, let you get home, have some dinner, and settle in for a cold one and, and talk about the game and what we saw out there when Pitt takes on Rhode Island. But that's the best way to do it. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on the notifications, and then you always know what's happening and when it's happening right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Pat Narduzzi held his uh, weekly press conference yesterday and sounds like he's not going to take my advice. <laughs> my advice, of course, uh, you know, I talked about it yesterday. I think I talked about it after the game on Saturday. I wrote about it on pantherlair.com. My advice is that you rest as many guys as possible. For this Rhode Island game. And it's no disrespect to Rhode Island. And yes, I know Pitt has lost to Youngstown State. I know the last time Pitt took this kind of rest a bunch of guys approach in an FCS game was probably the Delaware game in 2019 that was much closer than it ever should have been. And they actually ran the risk of losing that. Interesting parallels there. Uh, the regular starting quarterback was hurt. They held him out just to be safe. And they started a redshirt freshman who was pretty much, uh, you know, getting his, I mean, who was getting his first playing time basically ever. And certainly his first career start, and he ended up barely eking out a close win over Delaware. Interesting contrast with last week, you know, when the starting quarterback was out, and they had to turn to a redshirt freshman making his first start ever. Um, except he was going on the road against an FBS opponent as opposed to playing at home against an FCS opponent, and he actually put on a pretty good show, did a pretty good job, and ended up, you know, at, at playing a major part in the victory, in, in a convincing three touchdown victory. But that's neither here nor there. We can make those comparisons later in the week. But if you watched the Morning Pit yesterday, if you read what I wrote on Pantheler.com over the weekend, if you, you know, or, and, and yesterday, if you listened to the postgame show on Saturday, I mean, I said these things a lot. I would rest a bunch of guys. Look, here, here's the list, all right? Here, here's the list of guys who either just flat out didn't travel to Western Michigan um, went there and didn't play due to injury or had to leave the game due to injury. All right, Keaton Slovis, Nick Patty, Owen Drexel, Gabe Hoy, Jared Wayne, Rodney Hammond, Devin Danielson, Deion Hayes, Habba Baldonado, Deslin Alexandra, Nate Temple, and Marquez Williams. 
Now, I think a few of those guys are probably going to be out long term, no matter what. Not necessarily the whole season, but they're going to be out for a while, no matter what. I don't think Nick Patty's coming back anytime soon. I imagine Owen Drexel is going to be out for a while. I think Rodney Hammond has a little while left on the shelf. I'm not entirely sure about Devin Danielson, but the fact that he didn't make the trip doesn't, you know, leads me to believe that he's not going to be back anytime soon. I think Dayon Hayes is going to be out for a little while. So you take those, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five guys out. And you're looking at another seven or so that, you know, I think the other seven all traveled. Um, some of them like Alexandra and um, Slovis and Hoy didn't play, um, even though they were there. And then other guys, obviously like Jared Wayne and, you know, Baldonado and Temple and Marquez Williams played and then came out of the game due to injury. I, and, so what I'm saying is I imagine the guys who traveled but didn't play and probably most of the guys who had to come out of the game due to injury might possibly be available this week, you know, depending on obviously depending on how they feel. And I don't think that coaching staff is going to take any unnecessary chances, but I, I am fully on the side of keeping them out altogether. And I even went so far as to say that I would rest Izzy Abanacanda, you know, after 31 carries this past week, total of what? 56 carries over the last two games. He's never had that kind of workload in his college career. And let's be honest, this game is a game they should be able to win without Izzy Abanacanda. And I probably would have said that last week at this time, that the you know Rhode Island is a team Pitt should be able to beat without Abanacanda. But I would definitely say it now after watching Vincent Davis and Sebo Flemister run pretty well against Western Michigan, who ostensibly should provide more resistance than Rhode Island will. If those guys are able to run against Rhode Island like they did against Western Michigan, then you don't need Izzy Abanacanda. That you can give him an extra week to recover from having 56 carries in the last two games. You can give him an extra week to recover from having 30-plus carries last week. And and the, the beating that he took in that game. And, you know, I don't... You know, I don't know. Maybe he feels great. Maybe he's bumped, you know, banged up and bumps and bruises. I, I don't know. But what I do know is rest is good. And I know you're going to need to rely on number two for you know those those next eight games that come after Rhode Island. But when I asked Pat Narduzzi, I'll bring up his quote, I said, you know, I, I asked him, it was my question in the press conference. I said, you know, with the workload that he had, given the amount, amount of work that he had in the last two games, would you consider resting him, giving him a week off so he can be ready for the ACC games? And Pat Narduzzi said, quote, not really. I mean, maybe don't give him 31 carries. I'm sure he wants to play. Put it this way, we put too much work in not to play. Unless he's banged up, he's going to want to play. They all want to play. We all want to coach. You get 12 great guaranteed opportunities to go out there and play. It's just another one of those opportunities to go make a name for yourself, brand yourself out there on the field. I think our players are going to take it. If I grabbed Izzy and said, I'm thinking about resting you this week, he'd look at me, coach, you don't like me. They want to play the game of football. They love football. They're going to go play. We'll rest him up Tuesday, Wednesday, give him less carries. He'll be ready to go Saturday, end quote. And, and on a certain level, I, I appreciate what Pat Narduzzi is saying there. I, I do. Love of the game type of stuff. You know, Real basic, kind of get down to the, the heart of it of why are you here? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are we doing this? Um, and ultimately, they're all there to do it because they love the game of football. Right. I mean, at the very basis, now everybody wants, everybody's got big dreams and everybody's trying to get rich and everybody's trying to go to the NFL. But at the heart of it, they're, they're football players who love football. And I appreciate that. You know, Izzy Bandicana wants to play. He might be salivating about, you know, the prospect of facing an FCS defense. And, and certainly it would help my prediction that he's going to lead the ACC in rushing this year. He's not quite, he's not currently there. He leads the ACC in total off or all purpose yards. Excuse me. He's not quite there in, in rushing. I think he's second be uh second behind Henry Parrish from Miami, I believe. I'll double check that stat. It would certainly help my prediction. I, you know, I think he could have the kind of game that would boost, you know, that prediction of him leading the ACC. But when it comes down to it, you know, when when you get it, when you set us, you know, you get away from the, you know, not to not to be crude about it, but you get away from the Norman Rockwell, you know, these guys just love to play thing. I mean, you're here for a, you have you have a very specific goal and a very specific mission here, and and it's repeating what you did last year and trying to build on what you did last year. 
And the game against Rhode Island, this game against Rhode Island doesn't really matter in that scheme. In, in that, you know, when you look at that grand scheme of things. And, that, and that's not to say that they can lose it or it doesn't matter if they win or lose. They have, of course, they have to win. My contention is they can win without a Banacanda, whereas for the next eight games, they're very much going to need him. And they might need him to carry the ball 25, 30 times again, a couple of weeks in a row. Why put any extra wear on 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 his legs? You know what I mean? Why why you know why put any more miles on the tires if you don't have to? And and there's an in between there, you know, which people have brought up, and and I I I could be talked into this. You just play him for the first quarter, you know, you just play him for the first few series. You build up a you know a couple touchdown lead, um, and then you you pull him out. And and quite frankly, you can make that case for Keaton Slovis as well. Um, I'm still leaning toward believing that both of those guys should not play, that Jared Wayne, even if he feels fine, should not play, that Habo Baldonado, even if he feels fine, should not play. Uh, you know, I think in all those instances, whether it's Wayne or Baldonado or Slovis or uh, Abanacanda, you have an opportunity to get those guys more reps uh, or get the guys behind them more reps, get Nate Yarnell and, you know, whoever, Bam Brima, um, you know, a defensive end behind Halba Baldonado or, you know, the other receivers behind Jared Wayne, the, obviously the running backs, like I mentioned, behind a Canada. It's a chance to get those guys extra work. It's, ch- it's a chance to get those guys better prepared for the ACC while giving your top guys two and five and nine and maybe 86 and 87, giving those guys time to rest and get as close to 100% as they're going to get for the, the the ACC games, the games that really matter, the games that are important, the games that are going to be challenges, the games that are going to be tough, the games where you're going to need 2 and 9 and 5 and 87 and 86. You know you're going to need them to win that game. You probably don't need them to win this game. And so I'm, I'm going to keep advocating for this all week, and, and maybe I'm on an island on this. Pat Narduzzi, obviously, like he said, doesn't agree with me. There is that middle ground that maybe if Slovis is ready to play, you play him for the first quarter. You play Abenikander for the first quarter. You play Jared Wayne for the first quarter. You play Gavin Bartholomew for the first quarter. To me, it's, it's unnecessary. You want to make a case that Keaton Slovis could benefit from all the reps that he can get as far as staying in rhythm with the offense, getting comfortable working with Jake Cradle at center? All right. You, you, you know, maybe, maybe I could, I could look at that, but not for more than a quarter. I, I just, you, you don't need to, I, I just don't think you need to do it in this game. And I think those guys can get some rest and, and give you now. I mean, look, Kenny Pickett played against New Hampshire last year and lit them up. You know, it's not, it's not like it's unprecedented for them to stick with their top players, you know, for one of these sort of, uh, you know, mid-season or end of the first third of the season uh, games against FCS opponents. But I, I wouldn't push it with any of them. And if anybody's even slightly dink, I, I would take the spring game approach. I would take the spring game approach. If, if there's a guy that, you know, given his current status, you would not play him in the spring game, don't play him against Rhode Island. Out of those top guys that we're talking about, the, those key guys that you know are going to be essential for you in the next eight games of the regular season. When we're talking about Jared Wayne and, and the photo keeps popping up of Kanate Mumfield's touchdown catch. I, I mean, you know, Mumfield, I, you know, I feel like he's on the verge, you know, and he might have a big game against Rhode Island. I think his three catches against Western Michigan were huge. And, and I think he's going to get on a little run here, either against Rhode Island or, Starting with the ACC schedule, when he's got Keaton Slovis and he's, you know, they're a little bit more at full capacity, um, you know, all hands on deck type of thing, heading into the ACC games. I, I think he's going to blow up, I, and I think he's going to get on a little streak of some big games. And uh, looking forward to seeing that. Um, depth chart wise, Pitt released a new depth chart yesterday, as they do every Monday, and you'll be shocked to know there were no changes. Starting running back is still listed as Israel Banacanda or Rodney Hammond, despite the fact that Hammond hasn't played since the season opener and did not travel to Western Michigan. Um, scrolling down, Owen Drexel is still listed as the starting center, despite the fact that he did not travel to Western Michigan. Uh, Jake Cradle, of course, is still listed as the starting right, starting right guard, even though he 
was the starting center at Western Michigan. And the right tackle is still listed as Matt Gonsalves or Gabe Hoy, despite the fact that Hoy has not played a snap in three games. On the defensive side, same sort of deal. Devin Danielson or David Green as a starter at one of the defensive tackle spots. Again, say it with me, despite the fact that Danielson did not travel to Western Michigan. Um, Deslin Alexandra or John Morgan at one of the defensive end spots, despite this fact that Alexandra has not played since the West Virginia game. They continue to list Solomon DeShields as the backup to Bengali Kamara and Tyler Wiltz to the backup at Shane Simon, uh, despite the fact that it's actually been flipped in practice. And, you know, in, in the games, Wiltz has been backing up Kamara at the star linebacker, and DeShields has been backing up Simon at the money linebacker. And I thought there was one other, and that's mostly it. As far as the uh, depth chart, tomfoolery and chicanery. And, I mean, it more or less, I mean, it's the exact same depth chart that it's been for the last three weeks. Because the, the season opening depth chart was a little bit different. It was Hoy listed ahead of Gonzalez, no or there. Abana Candle listed ahead of Hammond, no or there. Uh, but otherwise, it's been pretty much that same depth chart since the beginning of the year. And it hasn't changed, and I'm guessing it won't change much. If there ever actually is a change, you'd think, my God, what actually caused them to go forward and actually change something here and maybe make it look a little bit more like what we're seeing on the field. All right, it's Tuesday, so we'll take a look around the Coastal Division and Pitt's uh, remaining ACC schedule. Look at the eight teams the Panthers have to face this year. And, um, you know, start with Miami. Went to Texas A&M, lost number 13 Hurricanes, couldn't hold up against the number 24 Aggies. They lose, and Miami drops like a rock from number 13 to number 25 in the AP poll. The downside, for Pitt at least, is Texas A&M, by winning against the number 13 team in the country, moves up a spot in the AP poll, and they end up jumping Pitt into the number 23 um, spot there. But Miami first loss of the season. Georgia Tech suffered its second loss of the season, and this was a rough one, 42 to nothing. Home loss to Ole Miss. Georgia Tech's now 1-2. and two. They've, you know, Their two losses have been in the two Power 5 games they played. They played Clemson and Ole Miss. They've scored a grand total of 10 points in those two games against Power 5 competition. And we're firmly in how much is Jeff Collins' buyout territory. And that question's being asked. Uh, Virginia Tech beat Wofford, the fighting Josh Conklins, 27-7 at home. Um, Virginia Tech has won two in a row after opening with a loss to Old Dominion, but they haven't scored 30 points yet. They haven't scored more than 27 yet. So, you know, Grant Wells, at least, after throwing four interceptions in the season opener, has not thrown a pick in the last two games. So the Marshall transfer is at least controlling the turnovers a little bit. Um, Still not really buying into Virginia Tech being any good. Kind of wondering if I'm supposed to start buying into Syracuse. I don't know. They're three and zero for the first time since 2018. They beat Sy- or they beat Syracuse. They beat Purdue at the Dome uh, over the weekend. 32-29. Pretty wild fourth quarter. 10 to nine was the score after three quarters. Uh, then fireworks, like five touchdowns between the two teams, or something like that. Um, ends up, you know, Purdue's up 29-25 with like 51 seconds to go, but then they commit. Two unsportsmanlike conduct penalties uh, after the touchdown, and then two more penalties door, during Syracuse's drive, like drive extending penalties. Third and ten, two bad penalties on third and ten, pushing Syracuse up the field. Uh, and then Garrett Trader makes the 25-yard touchdown pass to win the game, 32-29. Like I say, Syracuse is three and zero, and they're going to host Virginia next week, which. I mean, you sit here and look at it now. I don't know what the line's opened at, but Syracuse should win that game. The game's at home, and Virginia is fresh off a win over Old Dominion, a 16-14 to win over Old Dominion. Virginia is not what it was last year. Brandon Armstrong threw for 284 yards on the season. Through three games, he's thrown two touchdown passes and three interceptions. Now, this is the guy who threw for like 60,000 yards last year. And he's got two touchdowns through three games and three picks. And to beat Old Dominion, Virginia had to kick a field goal in the final minute. Virginia, I don't know where we ranked Virginia on the scariness scale in the Coastal Division before the year, but 
they're pretty low right now. They might be lower than Duke, who is now 3-0 after beating North Carolina A&T 49-20. Riley Leonard threw two touchdown passes. Duke ran for 222 yards. They're 3-0, and they're going to play at Kansas next week. Opportunity to go to 4-0 with two wins over Power 5 competition. They beat Northwestern, and they have a chance to win at Kansas before they dive into ACC play. Is Duke good? Is Syracuse good? I mean, right now they're undefeated. And I know you can talk about schedules and who they played, but, I mean, Syracuse beat Purdue. Syracuse beat Louisville, right? Are they good? Are they are, are they good or are they ACC good? You know, because there might be a distinction there, and, and those two might not be the same thing. Um, North Carolina was off this week. They're three and zero. They're going to host Notre Dame on Saturday, so that'll be a big game for the Tar Heels. They've been, you know, walking on the edge of a razor blade, uh, you know, through these first three games. And Notre Dame might finally have some momentum. We'll see. I I don't really know if I think either one of those teams is any good. So it'll be interesting to see what that game looks like. And then Louisville pits other opponent from the. Um, uh, from the Atlantic Division, lost to Florida State. Pretty interesting game to watch. Tate, Tate uh, Rodemaker, who is a, a name for the past. If you follow Pitt recruiting, he was in the class of 2020. Pitt, uh, you know, that was Mark Whipple's first year at Pitt. He had just been hired, um, you know, in January of 2019. And so he spent that year trying to recruit quarterbacks for the class of 2020. He was on Tyler Van Dyke, who you might know is at Miami. He was after a couple other guys. Missed on the mall, and then, like, in December, I, I think it was actually, so Pitt played at Georgia Tech in early December in the season finale in 2020, the COVID year, right? That was a Saturday. Two days later, uh, Mark Whipple went to Tate Rodemaker's high school and, uh, you know, saw him in person and offered him a scholarship. And at that time, he was committed to South Florida uh, he was pretty high on Pitt. Pitt was uh, a Power 5 school that was moving on him. Rodemaker wanted a Power 5 opportunity. Baylor was heavily involved. Um, South Florida was fighting to try to hold on to him. Virginia Tech tried to get after him. I think Northwestern was was pushing as well. Ultimately, Florida State was the one that swooped in and pulled him away. Not too surprising. But anyway, Rodemaker got called into action after Jordan Travis, who was one of the sort of breakout players in the first few weeks in the ACC. Jordan Travis got hurt, which, by the way, should be a shock to no one when Florida state was playing LSU. I, I remember watching it. it was the season, you know, first game of the season. And, and I'm thinking this Travis kid is great. He's awesome. He's fun to watch. I also don't think he's going to play the whole year playing the way he plays. Sure enough, here he is. He gets knocked out in the second quarter of the third game of the season. Rodemaker comes in six of 10 for one Oh nine, two touchdowns and a pick ends up uh, winning the game um, over Louisville. Malik Cunningham, Throws for 243 yards, a touchdown, and a pick on 21 to 34 passing. More relevantly, he runs 17 times for 127 yards and two touchdowns on the ground. Louisville is going to host South Florida next week and see if they can get a second win here, uh, one and two after three weeks. So, you know, looking down the rest of these eight games, I mean, you know, that, that season finale against Miami is always going to be a game that you schedule. And probably as we do this every Tuesday, look around the Coastal, we're going to say that. We're going to say that game against Miami is, you know, again, one. You, I mean, that that's the big one. That's what it all should come down to. You're not really worried about Georgia Tech or Virginia Tech. Virginia is lumping itself into that category of teams you're not too worried about. Carolina can score, but I really don't think they can stop anyone. You know, I mean, they haven't shown an ability to really stop anybody. I mean, they've gotten lit up um, so far this season. Um, so maybe maybe a shootout situation there. And then you, you get to like Syracuse and Duke. I, I mean, I can't take them seriously just yet, but they're both 3-0, and you know, and that's something to watch. You know, Duke, Duke's beat reporter said that the goal for Duke and maybe Duke wouldn't state this, but the Reed reporter did, said the goal for Duke would be four wins in 2022. Well, they've already got three. So, they're pretty close to that goal. 
I need I need to see a few more games. I need to see them get into ACC play. Same thing with Syracuse. I need to see them get into like, and I know Syracuse already played an ACC game, but I need to see these guys get a few games into the schedule before I really start buying into the idea that Syracuse is good or Duke is good because I'm not ready to buy into that just yet. And Louisville, Malik Cunningham can hurt you with his legs, but that's the major threat and maybe the only threat right now. He doesn't seem very dangerous as a passer, and I'd have to think back about, you know, over the years under the Narduzzi era, how many times a quarterback like that has really beat Pitt or given Pitt trouble. I need to kind of dig into the research books on that one and see what I can find out because I can't, nothing really comes to mind. You know what I mean? Like even, you know, I can't really think of a good option, but we'll, we'll keep trying to think of it uh, over the next few weeks before that Louisville com- game comes. So, I mean, I guess my point is you look down these eight games and right now, the ones you're saying are, whoa, those those are the biggest threats. You're talking about Syracuse and Duke? I mean, the schedule lays out for them the way it does. And, and the schedule present the schedule is going to present a lot of opportunities heading into that finale against Miami. It really is. And we'll see. You know, we'll see how season progresses. But it's been an interesting start, no doubt. All right. Make sure you like this video. We appreciate that. Uh, appreciate the engagement for sure. Leave a comment uh, or a question. We'll definitely answer that just like we do during the Wednesday night live show, 8.30 p.m. right here on youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. Like I said, we do it every Wednesday night. We get together and just talk pit sports, pit football, basketball, recruiting, whatever's going on. You post your comments and questions in the chat screen. I answer as many as I can. And uh, we have a little pit conversation for an hour. It's always fun. Uh... So we do that. We'll have a post-game show after the Rhode Island game on Saturday, probably a few hours after the game. We'll see what time that comes together. And then we'll have these Morning Pit episodes every day, Monday through Friday, every morning, uh, right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com. So stay tuned to the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. It's the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet. Get all your coverage right there. And then check out the Morning Pit episodes every day on youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. So thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for watching this video. We appreciate it. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. We'll talk to you Wednesday morning for another Morning Pit right here on youtube.com slash pantherlaircom.